where I've matured emotionally and spiritually and the biggest thing that I have learned is to bring source into every every circumstance. Oh my goodness, we are here with Gina DeVee. This woman is so fierce. You can tell by her shirt. Um, those of you who are watching, if you're listening, let me just tell you, when we met at Soho House, mm -hmm. her energy, her vibe, everything about her was just like a breath of fresh air. So welcome to the Get Loved Up podcast. Well, thank you. It's so great to be here. And it's hard to not be in high vibration when you like walked in with all your big energy and your book. And I knew we would be fast friends. Uh, what do you feel like is that? Because everyone you meet is not that instant like, ooh, I love you. I love you too. You're yeah. like the energy. Like yes. everyone doesn't have the energy. What do you think it is that really connects women? Because you are all about connecting women. Yes. And I just kind of want to start there because I feel like we had that instant connection. Totally. Yes. And I wish I had that instant connection with everyone, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be honest. And I don't like to fake it. If it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. You know? But we have that. What do you think that is? We're go-getters. Yeah. You know, like we're excited about life and opportunity and exploring. And I think that we just, you know, we saw that in each other mm -hmm. and, and we vibe and we like doing life that way. Yeah. It makes life fun. Mm -hmm. It's definitely fun. You definitely are a fun person. So you have this book, which I want to just dive right into. The Audacity to be Queen. I mean, <laughs> that's a fierce title. It is. It is. What inspired this book? Women. Women and this time on the planet and and who we are there's there we know that there's so much in us there's power there's potential there's sexuality there's femininity there's fierceness there's um like strength there's divinity there's the spirit that we like we have it all mm -hmm. and we have been told to be set aside we have been told all the lies of you know stay in the box and be polite and be politically correct and it's just made us boring and it's made us not who we are and it's made us not happy and not really fulfilling our destiny so I wrote this book because I am obsessed with the ancient story of Queen Esther of Persia, which mm. Christians know it from the Bible, Jews know it from Purim, anyone else knows it as a Cinderella story. And real quick, if anybody doesn't know it, it is there was a Jewish orphan girl named Esther. She was exiled out of Israel once her parents died to Persia. She was then living with her only relative who was still living. And at that time, the king of Persia wanted to call in a new queen. So they rounded up all the young girls of the land, threw them in the palace harem. The king picked a new queen. Unbeknownst to him, he picks the Jewish orphan girl. And right after she becomes queen, there's a law issued to kill, destroy, and annihilate all the Jews in the land. So her cousin goes to her and he's like, you got to go to the king and tell him who you are and save your people. And she's like, no, 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 not me. And he's like, Esther, for such a time as this, you have been called into royalty to save your people. Mm. And she does, she goes into prayer and fasting. She goes into spiritual principles. She puts on her royal robes and then she goes and she stands before the king and she, I'm paraphrasing here, but she goes and says, I'm a Jew. Will you save me and my people? He does in my book, she's the heroine of all time. Mm. So what I'm obsessed with is only from the position of queen can we fulfill our calling. We all have this for such a time as this moment. And in some way, we're all that Jewish orphan girl. They were just that ordinary woman, but God has a larger destiny for our life. That is such a beautiful story. And I love the way you paraphrase it. And how do you step, take that step to stand in your power? I know you said that, you know, she went into prayer and fasting. Is that the key for you? Or what is the key to really get you past that fear? Like, oh my God, no, not me. I can't mm -hmm. to, okay, I am the queen. Absolutely. Let me do what I need to do. Yes. So, you know, every day is an opportunity for spiritual growth. And I think we spiritual people, we like, we know spiritual principle, but you know, but sometimes we put it over here and then we're like, this is our job and this is my marriage and this is our life and this is the relationship and we, we keep it separate. And right now, um, I'm personally, after having written the book and, and in the, the launch of it, I'm very much in a place where um, things are coming in every, in every direction that I did not anticipate. Mm. And so I'm in a growth, 
opportunity phase uh, more intense than, than I have been in a while. And what is getting me through is remembering that source is source. Because I'm, I've been in reaction to thinking that someone else who's in charge of something is source or that a certain situation is source. And when it's not showing up in the time that I want it to or the way that I want it to, my the, the princess in me is like, but that's not fair and it's not supposed to be this way. And then I remember the queen is connected with spirit mm -hmm. and the queen knows better. And it just because like the queen can see things not as they are, but as they could be and as they will be. So just because things aren't turning out in every area of my life the way I want them to right now, I'm rising above and the only way I can rise above is through prayer. And what are those ways that are challenging, those growth opportunities? Oh, like what's, what are they specifically? Yeah. Um, specifically, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with my launch, or should I say not going on with my launch, that um, my princess self could have been devastated by, but who's dramatic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Disappointed by, angry, mad, so-and-so was supposed to do this, this was promised, that was supposed to happen. And so for me, I find, you know, any area of my life could be a um, spiritual awakening. But I talk about in the book, there's really three schools. There's the school of health, the school of love, and the school of money. And money, career, success, that kind of thing. I'm very much in the school of money, career, success. So the way that my best spiritual growth comes is when I am challenged or have growth opportunities in my career. My relationship is like the easiest part of my life. Like it's like, it's, it never challenges me or hardly ever, but this is the area. So this is my trigger spot. This is my place of real vulnerability. This is the place where I can be tempted to go into any of the lower level archetypes, the victim, the martyr, the bitch, the slave girl. And so it's this, like I'm getting a hit with like all these opportunities mm -hmm. to choose queen, choose queen, remember who source is, remember who source is, and see things not as they are, but as they could be and will be. I love that. And so you, as queen, and I, I can tell you, I went through the same thing with my launch. So I thought everybody else's launch was perfect. No, <laughs> exact same thing. And what does choosing queen really look like practically? Well, because I'll tell you, because I made a decision last night, as a matter <laughs> of fact. So um, my, my, I've always planned, so I have an amazing publisher. I've got a top five publisher in New York City. It's Hachette Books. And I've always planned to be in New York City on the my pub day, on my publishing day and launch date. And there were supposed to be all these like events and media and like all this stuff happening. And as of yesterday, there's one, which I'm very grateful for, radio interview, that um, the host is actually not even going to be in New York City. So I kept being told, just stay in LA, do it remotely. Just like come to New York another time. Like, and the emails, they kept coming. And it was like, it kept like, just stay home, like do it remotely. And I was like, waited 20 years to write my book like this is like suppose like I've lost 12 pounds I'm whitening my teeth I'm gonna be all dressed up and know where to go and no like no I can't stand at a bookstore or sign my book and so like I I literally I like I came undone like I was just crying and I felt bad for myself I got angry at other people and fortunately writing this book and doing this work I didn't stay in it as long as I like I, but I kept praying like dear God dear God I know you have a plan I know you have a way like I'm asking for your favor and just like really staying and like where am I supposed to be and how can I be of greatest service and and still practice like you know like as women we're not great at celebrating ourselves and our accomplishments and so mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work to like be available to be visible to be celebrated and there's no I can go to dinner with my husband but I do that about six nights a week anyway so I was like mm, Gina spirit what and I in my queenhood decided with one week's notice to throw myself a party mm. and the party wasn't there for me so I'm making the part so I found a space I called caterers and I literally uh, about two hours ago, sent out the word, I'm going to be in New York City, here's the address, and come to my book launch party, and it's going to be that. So that's what being a queen looks like in this oh, moment for me. That is such a beautiful story. I love that. That is so powerful because it just also speaks to, if it's not there for you, create it yourself. Absolutely. And that is phenomenal. And you also have a 
philosophy around divine living. I mean, yes. that is definitely divine living. But can you talk to us more about what it is to live yes. in alignment with divine There will living? be champagne. No, it's not. divine ah. living is about more than that. Um, <laughs> so divine living for me is about having a spiritually and divinely divine contribution in the world. Mm -hmm. So whether it's career, whatever your contribution is, and a divine lifestyle. And where Divine Living was really born for me is I'm obsessed with spiritual growth and I am obsessed with lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it was for, you know, I'm 47, so growing up in the, you know, as a child in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you're obviously, you, you were one or the other. You know, you are, if you're spiritual and you're into personal development and you want to make the world a better place, that's all great. But if you are into Jimmy Choo's and Five Star Hotels, the Amalfi Coast and, you know, jet setting, mm, you got to like switch camps. Mm. And for me, so I started out being a psychotherapist, really looking to transform people's lives and change the world. But I was a broke psychotherapist with $75,000 in debt and tax liens and um, student loans and, uh, and all of that. And I also just always have loved food, fashion, travel, the whole thing. And so I found that helping people transform their lives and not being financially supported was not my idea of a good time. Mm -hmm. And then just hanging out and shopping and all the Gucci anyone wants is so empty and meaningless at the same time too. So the lifestyle without the meaning or the meaning without the lifestyle for me is boring. Mm -hmm. So divine living is having a meaningful career and a divine lifestyle. I love that. I love that. And how can people do that? Because a lot of people are like, I want that and I'm checking all the boxes and I'm taking all these online courses, but it ain't happening for me. What do you mean, making the money? Yeah. Mm. They have my purpose, but I'm not able to stack the coin. So, the queen is unavailable for lack of clarity or lack of manifestation. And I find, and I, and I, I say this with compassion because I've like I've been through like every step of this journey. Um, when people, and I'm going to talk about women here, when women are unclear, it's because there's a certain element of princess going on because the princess will live in the fantasy. I know what my purpose is, so how come the money is just not coming? Or I'm doing everything right, and I, you know, I'm doing everything that I know to do. That's not even humanly possible. So stop saying it. <laughs> <laughs> I've done everything I know to do and it's still not working. And so queens follow a no excuses policy. Mm. And what I found is, you know, and this stuff is sneaky and it's unconscious. Really, 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 really wanting to make money doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If wanting worked, we'd all be skinny billionaires. Wanting doesn't count for anything. A must, a place of non-negotiable. Um, I remember even with my book title, I was like, I don't know what this is. I don't have clarity. It hasn't downloaded yet. And... Finally, I, I realized what a place of disempowerment I was enabling myself. And if manifestation of any form, the, the name of your book or money or love, any of it, comes from source, then you get with your relationship with source. And mm -hmm. I sat down, I happened, to, I happened to be in New York City at that time. I remember where I was sitting and I sat down in this apartment and I, and I meditated and I said, I am unavailable to not know the title of my book. And, I, and, and then it dropped in. But there's this fierceness that you've got to get to. My whole saga, drama, yada around money, it's because on a certain level, I was available to suffer that way. Mm -hmm. I was available to play small. I was available for the drama. I was available for the brokenness. And I didn't walk around consciously saying that. Like, there was nothing I thought I wanted more than to... Um, be financially healthy mm -hmm. and I didn't know what wealth consciousness was I didn't know that I didn't have wealth consciousness but when the student is ready the teacher does appear so to someone saying I'm doing everything I would say on I really check yourself because there's so many great mentors teachers coaches and ways to make money that there's something in your wealth consciousness that's or lack thereof that is keeping you in princess and out of queen. I love that. I love that. So you have to step into the queen, step into your fi power, find out what works. Queen, it takes a lot of money to be a queen. Queens mm -hmm. aren't broke. Mm -hmm. 
Right. <laughs> and so what do you feel like is that, like, what was that turn on for you? Like in that moment where you're like, you know what, what helped you get from princess to queen? Amazingly, not what I thought it was going to be and not what most people think. Because mm -hmm. I was just running around, just someone just tell me what to do. Just, just, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll work hard. I'll work 18 hours. I will do anything. Just tell me what to do. And the first person I said that to was, who is now my husband, but he wasn't at the time. Um, he said, it's all between the temples. Mm -hmm. And it made me so angry. <laughs> is he talking about, oh, what does that mean? It's all between the temples. I just have to do something because I was trained. My parents were school teachers. I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. If you want to make money, you work hard. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I was taught. And, but I was, didn't really connect the dots that I was working hard. I was working like 75 hours a week and I wasn't making more money, not really. So fortunately, when the student is ready, the teacher does appear. And I was invited to a Bob, Pro I didn't know who he was at the time, a Bob Proctor Science of Getting Rich seminar. Mm -hmm. And there was, he was talking about wealth consciousness. And, you know, growing up in this spiritual environment, you know, money is the root of all evil and don't focus on money. And it was, you know, all the opposite. And he starts out saying, like, you're never going to live a really fulfilled life unless you have a lot of money. And I was like, <gasps> but my soul was like, hallelujah, like, how, of course you need money to live your purpose and a lot of it because you have a big purpose. And during the course of that event, the, my consciousness changed. And I owned and took radical responsibility that I sadly had been the queen of, I'd love to, but I don't have the money. Mm -hmm. that, like that was my mantra. Hey, Gina, want to come on this trip? I'd love to, but I don't want to go to this cool new dinner spot. Love to, but I don't have the money. Want to take this course? I'd love to, but I don't have the money. Like that was just what I told myself all the time. And therefore that was my reality. Mm. And here I just thought I was being honest. And... I, my consciousness raised during that time because it was just like everybody was like just thinking bigger thoughts and I made the decision and a decision means to cut and I made the decision that I would never again say I'd love to but I don't have the money mm. and I made one more decision there at that seminar and I said I will never again struggle with money now at this time I had sixty dollars in my bank account with no known money coming in and so it's not about like, oh, when the money comes in, then I won't struggle anymore. I made the decision that I was going to learn how to make money like I was going to learn how to speak Russian. Like I dropped the drama. I didn't care how long it took anymore. Like I was going to speak Russian. Like I was going to learn how to make money. And I hoped that it wouldn't take forever, but it actually didn't even matter anymore because I made the decision. So I was coming from such a queen, empowered, fierce place mm -hmm. that this will happen no matter what now. Right. And how long did it take you from that setting that intention that day? How long did it take you from that point into where you feel like, okay, I'm here? Or do you even feel like that? <sighs> I... I'll tell you the biggest gift that has come from making money is that I no longer have those 2 a.m. gut-wrenching feeling like I'm going to die and the sky is falling. Like, I don't have that. I have different challenges in business and cash flow stuff and invest, you know, making big investments and like catching up with my big dreams. So there's, there's other, but that's just business stuff. That's not like this survival. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, the, because the psychology has changed, I no longer spend my energy fearing and worrying about it. Mm -hmm. And I spend time thinking about how to create or expand the abundance, mm -hmm. if that's what's needed. So, how long did that take? Not long, it took longer to struggle with mm -hmm. it. You know, I was in like, from 20 to 35 or whatever, like I was just in the struggle. And once I got this information, I mean, I had my first financial miracle in two weeks mm. uh, coming out of that seminar. Um, and, and then I would say, like, strength grows in increments. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I'm sure we could use a yoga analogy here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, it's like you get stronger and strong, like, and you start to feel the nuances right. of like, oh, even yesterday I wasn't that strong, or last week I wasn't that strong, and so it becomes this really beautiful 
strengthening process. So I have much to learn still mm -hmm. with it. I think the biggest gift I gave myself is to get out of the unnecessary fear that right. I was consumed by. And I like what you say, you said financial miracle. What is a financial miracle? Like, what did that look like for you? Oh, you want to hear the story? Yes. <laughs> okay. So at the time, I was so I was a struggling psychotherapist, mm -hmm. sliding scale rates, in debt, yada. So I'm like, Detroit's done, psychotherapy's done. I'm moving to L.A., the land of the rich and the happy and beautiful people. <laughs> so I thought, right? Because right. you know, when you're sitting at home in Detroit, it's like Friday night. It's like you're watching Entertainment Tonight after like a 75-hour work week and it, living at home with your parents. It's like you know, joy. So anywho, um, I was no longer going to be a psychotherapist that struggled with that. I was going to move to L.A. and become a life coach. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I had my Tony Robbins hour of power, and I'm watching these people make big money, and I'm like, I have a master's degree in clinical psychology, even though I'm charging like $25 a session. But um, <laughs> I, so I came up with a $6,000 package. Sexy, right? Not when you sell one every four to six months. Not so mm. sexy. So instead of being just consistently broke all the time, I was neurotically broke. It was like feast or famine because it was like a slot machine. Any day, I could land a client. So whatever. I, I did have like two or three clients at, at this particular moment. And I just moved to L.A. And the novelty had worn off because I was now depressed, had no friends, um, had no list or website even and I, I had my three clients and um, oh yeah the $75,000 in debt like family wasn't really talking to me at the time there were lots of meltdowns I had was down to $100 in my bank account so back to prayer <laughs> uh, the one consistent in my life and I just prayed I was like what am I supposed to do like how like I'm in like there's so much it's so close and so far away mm -hmm. so this friend called invites me to like, I got a free ticket to a seminar. Great. It was like a friend of a friend and it was a free. And I just said, yeah, I didn't even know what it was going to. Mm -hmm. So I put $20 of gas in my car. So I have $80 on my debit card and I drive down to Orange County and then I walk in and there's like these people, they were like happy. They were like buzzing around and high fiving each other. And like, I didn't even realize how used to who I got to my, like, it wasn't like a clinical depression, but just being in a funk, like a bit of depression pressed state and the secret had just come out and I had heard everyone's talking about the secret the secret the secret mm -hmm. at this point it was a DVD and I look at I look at the table and I'm like you don't normally spend this much time contemplating a $20 DVD purchase but when it's like what 30% of your net worth what was when mm -hmm. I had $80 in my bank account and 20% 20 20 of your net worth you you consider these things so yeah. I uh, but I bought the DVDs being the risk taker that I am, bought the DVD and went and sat down in the back because I certainly wasn't going to talk to these yahoo, woo woo, <laughs> freakazoid people. I was just here to, I don't know, whatever. So I'm there in the seminar and I, I told you that, like, raise the consciousness and, mm -hmm. like, I'm starting to feel good and I'm happy. And then it's like, um, wow, like, there really is more than enough money in the world for everyone. There, there are more than enough clients. Like this was such a radical thought that there's more than enough money. And nobody had ever said that in my world. That there's that more than enough clients. Clients are hard to get. They're scarce. They're this or that. So, and I was just like, I was feeling so happy. And I just told myself, I'm never again going to say I'd love to, but I don't have the money. And then this woman walks up on stage because there've been all these like dudes in suits and stuff. And this woman walks up on stage and she gave this amazing presentation. And I was like, and then I was like, oh my gosh, she's a coach. I, I got to get coached by her. Like this is going to be like I want to have a life again. Like this, like I'm a great student. I'm going to do what she says. I'm going to learn how to make money. This is going to be amazing. And then she tells me, or the, the whole audience, that her program is seventeen thousand dollars. Mm. Now, I, I didn't even know anybody that ever had $17,000 at one time in my <laughs> life. And I thought, well, if I had $17,000, why would I need her to coach me? I would like, have the answer to like the cure to cancer and the answer to like, you know, how the world exists and the meaning of life. I was like, but I'm a queen. And I would make, when I make a commitment, I make a commitment. And I told myself I would never again say I'd love to, but I don't have the money. So I march up to her on the, the break, and she's like super tall, and I'm like, hi, I'm Gina. I'm, um, I'm going to be your next student. I just have a question for you. Do you accept a payment plan? No. Oh. I'm like, you. <laughs> I'm like, you have all this 
this money? Don't you realize what a star student I'd be and give you the best testimony? I'm like she needed, it. like you know. And I was like, I couldn't even like. But this, this was my lifeline. Like I could not let go of this. And so I took the book that they gave me, the three ring binder, the little order form, and I walked over to her assistant and I filled out that form with all sixteen numbers of my debit card with expiration date. And I handed her that form and I said, "You give me two weeks until you run that card." And I went with my three ring binder under one arm and the secret under the other and I drove myself back to LA mm -hmm. and I see myself with 30,000. Oh, there was another, pre uh, another coach that came up and had $10,000 package. No problem. Signed up for that one too. So I basically needed $30,000 in two weeks. So I'm like driving up to LA. I see myself with $30,000 in two weeks. I see myself with my online banking visual. I'm practicing everything I'd been taught. The mantras, the visualizations, the emotion, the feeling. I see myself with $30,000 in two weeks. I see myself being coached by these coaches. I see myself having Having friends, I see myself having a life again. I see myself with thirty thousand dollars in one week. In five days, my now husband, then boyfriend, was like, "Hey, Gina, what are we gonna?" No, there will be no talk of any negativity. There will be no focus on anything other than the full and total manifestation of the thirty thousand dollars in five days, in four days, in three days. Well, two days before the deadline, I was working with one of my clients who. Um, it, this was marriage coaching at the time because clearly I didn't know anything about business. And it was the last session of his package. And he said, so, you know, this has been great. The marriage is great. I've really loved working with you. And I'm just thinking like, yeah, I didn't know anything about re-enrolls or anything like that. I just like thought I was wrapping it up. And he says, um, I think I'd like you to coach my sales team. Well, I was terrified to talk to him about business because I didn't, I thought if I just kept it in the relationship realm, he would know I was smart. And then if we talked about business, he'd know I was an idiot. Mm. And I said, so what do you coach? Basement waterproofing. I didn't look that different then than I do today. And I'm like, really universe? Basement waterproofing sales director, really? How many people are on your team? That sounds like a smart sales manager -y kind of question to ask, right? He says, 10. I'm out. Like, I, I, I got nothing else to ask. I'm like, well, I, well, I don't know what to say. And so he says, so what do I do? Buy 10 of those $6,000 packages of yours? That's right. <laughs> That's exactly what you do. <laughs> And the last day of my deadline, not thirty, but sixty thousand dollars was wired wow, into my bank. Wow, that account. is amazing! What a great story. My first financial miracle. Two weeks later, after the decision that I said and promised myself I would never again say I'd love to, but I don't have the money. That's amazing. So from there, it's just like, all right, I know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Just believe it, feel it, say it, and own it. And. Dance with the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there's so much opportunity. There's like when you get great at receiving, that's so much what being the queen is about, is getting your feminine. And when you actually make yourself available to receive, I couldn't believe how much I was the one blocking out the abundance. Because right. I was the one saying it can't happen. I was the one saying not now, next year. I was the one saying I can't charge that much or who am I to do this. I was the one saying business was hard. I was the one saying I'm not good at business. So it was your own limiting beliefs. Completely. Mm. Still is to whatever it is I'm having growth experiences over. Right? <laughs> Isn't that funny how no matter how much you do, you still, we all still have these growth opportunities, learning experiences. Mm -hmm. And what do you feel like is the biggest lessons you've learned from then to now? <sighs> it's, it, it's... I know the way this is going to sound, but until the experience is such, that's where the difference is. And the biggest difference is a deeper connection with spirit. Mm. It's, um, you know, I've grown up always having a relationship with God. I grew up in a, like a fundamentalist born again Christian household. So like one thing you get out of that environment is a relationship with the big guy from day one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've always had the relationship, but you know, when I kept it separate, um, when I like reserved it for Sundays or even when I reserved it for my morning routine. Like I do a morning routine every morning, but like am I applying 
God being source to that email that comes in at 617 with the alleged bad news. Mm. And so I think that where I've matured emotionally and spiritually, and the biggest thing that I have learned is to bring source into every, every circumstance. And it has, relatively speaking, like almost 90% removed all triggers. I love that. And that is so powerful because I feel like we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So when you connect with spirit, you're divinely guided. So in that spirit, I like also how you connect spirit and queendom. Yes. You know, it's, it's not just you. So can you talk a little bit about that and what you believe that the guiding force in being a queen? Well, the, the wisdom in a queen would never settle for the mortal mind alone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where we access our miraculous powers. That's where we can bend time and space. That's where we can call down the, the favor of the universe. And so anything else is just toiling. Like mm -hmm. if you're just, just functioning on pure humanness, um, that's beneath the queen because she's so much wiser than that. She's so much more in tune. She knows about the angelic realms and the forces that are going on behind the visible eye. And she knows the unlimited nature of the universe. So the way women, we have cut ourselves off from our feminine instincts and our spirituality and our sensuality, um, the queen doesn't do that. And she has restored and healed um, any of the areas that have been injured. That's beautiful. So the queen has a tight relationship with God. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That is beautiful. And what do you feel like also like from having this recent challenge with like the book launch and everything, mm -hmm. which is crazy for all of us, um, what do you feel like your lessons are? Have you really even taken a moment to think about what am I learning here? Yes. So uh, th there are so many. One is never give up. Mm -hmm. I know everyone says that, but it's like, like really, like I had a choice, you know, like it made so much sense to just stay home, celebrate, like my people are here in LA, like go to, just reschedule, go another time. Um, so, but for me, that would have been an experience of self-abandoning. Mm -hmm. So keep going, don't give up. Um, oh, but there was another one that was, kind of, oh, this is like the, probably the newest one. I'm waiting to be dazzled. You hear that? Mm -hmm. Because our success in whatever area of our life, whether you've got a, a diagnosis, an addiction, a relationship thing, and for me it's this, it's, there's nothing mediocre about God or spirit. And anything in our life that looks meh, it's, you know, I mean, we're grateful. We're grateful for our, our homes and our body. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I didn't give up and I'm going to go throw this amazing party. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting much more, mm -hmm. much more as a queen. And the thing that God is showing me right now is like, it is not going to come from me. It is not going to come from me working 18 hours a day, sending another email, pushing that boulder up the hill, trying to elbow my way and trying to convince someone to see something, you know, like I have done everything I, what felt led to do right before crazy making. Right. And, and, and so what I feel like God is showing me is that, um, time for you to see what I can do. So my job right now is to maintain the faith, mm. keep my standards high, and wait to be dazzled. Mm -hmm. I mean, Moses got the Red Sea parted. I don't think <laughs> I'm like loved any less than Moses, you know? <laughs> Esther got to be queen of Persia. I mean, Jesus walked down, like there's like some dazzle I'm waiting for here. Mm -hmm. And I think if everyone just had that, that comedy, that comedy and that openness of, waiting to be dazzled and knowing that we are all deserving of the best life has to offer. Totally. Like I honestly, and I don't think it looks the same for everyone, mm -hmm. but I definitely feel like we all, you know, deserve the best life to offer. And the more that we align with that vibration, 
the more that we will feel that coming in our lives. And we have a similar philosophy around money and energy. And I yes. kind of want you to dive into that because I feel like that energy also kind of plays into what you're experiencing now. Totally. So, you know, money used to be the biggest mystery in the world to me. And to really get that money is currency mm -hmm. and currency is energy. Everything is about a frequency. Mm -hmm. And so, and everything is, frequencies are about vibrational matches. And so, um, well, I'll say this. So when I was, the, so there's a lot of things that create a vibration. So one is going to be, let's say, your talent, your work ethic, your attitude. But then there's the wealth consciousness around it. And the wealth mm -hmm. consciousness is about abundance. It can be about money. It can be about opportunity, any of it. But it is an energy. And to the degree that like, I can look back and see, I've always been a very naturally gifted um, psychotherapist and I was well trained, but this was like not something I worked very hard for, to be honest. It was, mm -hmm. it was a natural gifting. People got major transformations. Like, you know, people say they need to leave their job to do something meaningful. I needed to leave my job to do something meaningless. Like, I, like, I, do you know, oh, transform another marriage, transform another life, addiction, like whatever. Like I do that 12 hours a day. However, I was also broke and struggling and offering these sliding scale rates. So what did that show me? My energy around self-worth, my energy around receiving, my energy around what I thought was possible financially because I was broke. I just assumed everyone else was broke, so I didn't want to charge them too much. Then I offered a sliding scale rate before they could even pay the full rate. Crazy, but mm -hmm. whatever. But so, so then fast forward. Went to seminar years ahead, later, and I saw this woman on stage who had less ex less experience than me, less education than me. With all due respect, she had a lot of great qualities, but she was not as good of a coach as I was. And I'm sitting there like idolizing her, like she's like the thing. And you know how much she was charging for a one day intensive? And this is like back in like the Flintstone era, $10,000 a day. And mm -hmm. I'm like trying to get my $60 an hour. And I was like, ah! So, Thankfully, spirit connection. I stay out of comparison itis in when it comes to pricing. Compare all the, in all other ways, but compare with pricing. <laughs> so I went home and I asked, I said, I want to do a one day intensive. So I was genuinely inspired because I liked that big container to create the transformation. And I and I asked, and I said, So so what's my rate for what's my energy basically what's my energy? What's my rate for one day intensive? And I like wait and I heard a thousand dollars. And I was grateful because I knew that that was spot on. It wasn't an overreach and it wasn't an underreach because it was, it was a, at that point, it was a little bit of a stretch for me. And uh, I was like, and I never collected a thousand dollars at a time before, you know, because mm -hmm. it was just my single session. So that felt like an advancement. And so energy wise, if you are, if you step into where you're at, and you don't future trip or live in the past, that's gonna be your most powerful place. Mm -hmm. So I was in high vibration, so I received that assignment from the universe. And I got my first client at $1,000, and I was so excited about it. And I, I gave all, and right after that, I felt my vibration raise, I felt my energy raise. So the very next one was 1,500. Mm -hmm. The very next one, then I got hip to this, uh, you know, Quick study. The <laughs> next one was three thousand with a three-day minimum. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I don't even do that now. But anyway, I mean, mm -hmm. I, the you know now now it, it's it's exponentially higher. I don't do the three-day minimum anymore. Mm -hmm. So the point is that as you, oh, here's was my the, my biggest point. When I was charging, you know, then it went to five to ten, fifteen, twenty. When I was charging that three thousand, even because it wasn't that long of a time gap. Mm -hmm. I wasn't that much better of a coach. Mm. I was that much stronger in my wealth consciousness. Mm -hmm. And how you value yourself. 100%. 100%. I didn't, that's what I didn't have. And people think it's like, like you got to offer more or be more or something. I had to you develop see more. more. Yes. So exactly. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful because I feel like so many of us, especially women, we don't see much in ourselves mm -hmm. and we are nurturers and we are, we're having children. But when it comes to money, when it comes to making money, we don't have a value because a lot of times, even looking at our parents, you know, 
most of our moms are like homemakers or, you know, doing that and having kids. And so now that we're stepping into one, one of keeping the feminine energy, but also want to have abundance in our life and really live our purpose. I feel like exactly what you said, we're not, you have to see it to be it. Like mm-hmm. you have to really know your worth and value and then ask for it. Yes. That is so powerful. Yes. Um, and, and when I had that awareness, uh, so I'll give a specific, when I was a marriage therapist and people would come in and they'd be like, well, we don't have the money for marriage counseling. I'd be like, no, but we got to save your marriage. It'll be okay. Like I'll reduce my rate. It's okay. So after about three sessions, they'd be, they'd give up. It wasn't enough time. They had decades of problems. Three sessions wasn't going to do it. And you know what? Every single time they each had five to $10,000 for, for retainers for their divorce attorneys. Mm. And I got so angry and I was like, why does the profession of law value this and just charge that? Like a a PhD psychotherapist go to school the same amount that attorneys do. Like, and we're supposed to offer these sliding scale rates and all that. Not that lawyers don't do pro bono sometimes, but it's not the same psychology in the field. And then I realized I was so angry at my clients for not valuing the service more. I was asking them to do what I hadn't done myself. I hadn't put a greater value on my own services. I put more value on the attorneys as well because culturally that's what you do. Like mm-hmm. attorneys are expensive, therapists aren't, like, you know. And when I shifted my perception of what I offer and what I value, the value I place on it, exactly what you said, um, that's when the wealth consciousness raised, the energy raised, and then the money raises. That's beautiful. And I think that's such a testament to, like you said, abundance and energy, not only when it comes to money, but also in your love life. So I kind of want to dip into there Ooh, and talk about good. like, uh-huh. all right, how do you attract that energy? Okay. So I, um, was just such a hot mess in terms of relationship. And mostly because I was invisible to myself. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see me, so I couldn't see relationship. And so, and I was, I was, I was chasing after all the wrong everything. Um, basically I was chasing after the local loser rock stars of Detroit because I didn't realize I wanted to be a rock star of my own life. So I was trying to date and then ultimately marry who I actually wanted to become. Mm -hmm. So once it did all that work, Then I realized, then I started to get clear on like, what kind of, for me, man, do I really look to, who do I want to attract? And the archetype that came up for me was king. And there's a lot of great archetypes out there. Not everyone doesn't need to go after a king. There's warriors, there's artists, there's monks. Like there's like a lot of cool ones, but I wanted a king. I wanted to be claimed. And I realized I didn't know anything about kings. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know anything about the empowered masculine. So I started studying. I started reading like all the, like Fire in the Belly and Iron John and like all the books from the 60s and like these dude. And then I like started, and then I realized the only rightful partner for a king is a queen. Mm-hmm. Well, I was good at slave girl, martyr, victim, and princess, but queen was so foreign to me at the time. And so I high t- I had enough of my king thing. I hightailed it over to like started studying like the empowered feminine, the divine feminine, and what did it really mean to be a queen and what did that look like? Because I was well aware. I'd done enough of the personal development. Like I knew it was going to be about who, who I was being is who I would attract. Mm. So I started spending much more time developing myself, falling in love with myself, becoming the queen, and pretty instantly then he came to find me Mm. we want to hear the romance oh (laughs) (laughs) look at all these stories give it give it i give it okay so um i had just moved to california Mm -hmm. and because i was going to manifest my 36 year old black haired green eyed um, house on Lake Como, Italian rock star boyfriend. I mean, I was clear. I had the vision board and the whole thing. <laughs> and, um, but I had scheduled what I call these Esther Experience workshops, and I had one more workshop in Detroit. And so I just got in here, but I, I flew home to do it. And I'm like, you know, it was like me, myself, and I back then. So like, I'm like in the little workshop space, like setting up my little flyers and the little like welcome sign in sheet and, 
um, you know, it was early in the morning, you know, before anyone got there, and I look up, and there's this man at the, at the door, and he's like in a suit, and he's like good looking, and I'm like, wrong spot, dude. I didn't say that, and and he's, um, I said, hi, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm here for the workshop, and I'm like, I got roses and candles and flowers, <laughs> like I mean, like, and I said, you can't be here. This is for women. And he stands there and he says, I'm a king, I haven't been with a queen, and I want to know what this queen thing is. Mm. So I'm like, well, you, you, you can sit in the back with the recording guy, who was my boyfriend at the time, and, mm. uh, you know, just like lay low. I, you know, I was just like, just like, you know, don't be distracting because it's, you know, it's for women. My boyfriend didn't show up that day and sent his assistant... So anyways, but that's okay, because like I'm like ready to do my Esther experience work, so there's flowers and candles, and the women are coming in, and I'm greeting them, and it's like, it's, and I started to hear these whispers, and they it's like, who's the man in the corner? Who's the guy in the corner? And I was like, getting angry, like he's distracting from my, like everyone, this is serious business here, ladies. Mm -hmm. Who's the guy in the corner? So I'm like, okay, step three of being queen is, and then people are like, yeah, and they're like, we want to hear from a man's perspective, and I was like, <laughs> No, I got this. And then it's like then it, then it was like communicating like a queen and I was like, I got this and I'm like totally just trying to be the star and uh some woman says something about what's going on with her husband and she's like, I really want to hear a man's perspective and I'm just like, Glenn, do you have anything to say? And mm -hmm. and he like he stands up and like all the like the, it was like in unison it was like <sighs> And you know how men do, they're just like, I mean, now it's just like Glenn in his harem, you know, because he's like getting all the energy of like, this is my moment. And I don't remember what he said, but it was articulate. And it was like, will you talk to my husband? No. Was like, I was like so angry. This like impromptu guest speaker was like messing with my program. Whatever. That was over. And so program ends. It went great. I'm like seriously like going around collecting my little valuation sheets because I'm all serious. And he comes up to me and he says, um, would you like to um, debrief your little workshop? <laughs> and I was like, and he goes, can I take you to dinner? And I'm like, sure. So we walk down the street to this restaurant and we're like sitting there talking and it's like totally hand in glove and it's like totally flow. And at, he just looks at me and he goes, I, I just love everything about you. And I was mm. like, you don't even know anything about me. Like, like don't, non queen language, mm -hmm. <laughs> alert, alert. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and, and um, I was like, look it, you're, you're a nice guy. You know, you're, you're going to find someone. I'm moving back to California. I'm going to get married and have kids. And he goes, I'd like to have a son. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> he was on it. I'm like, okay, internal princess going through her checklist. He's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed chiropractor from Michigan who's been married for and basically has kids my age. Not anywhere, I'm clear of my criteria. And the veil lifted right there at dinner and said, he is the one. And I grabbed that veil and I was like, the hell he is. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I have waited for for my first husband. Are you kidding? So anyways, I... Um, I'm like, look, don't call me. I'll call you. I got a journal about this or something. I mean, it was like so awkward and weird and dorky. And so I go back to California, not expecting to hear from this man. And this woman pulls into my driveway in like this 1972 like station wagon or something. And she gets out with this arrangement of white peonies and like waddles up to my house. She's like, are you Gina? And I was like, yes. And she's like, here. And I'm like, and she's like, don't lose the card, and waddles off and drives off. And so I go in, and I set down the flowers, and it says, to a rare and beautiful queen, your loving King Glenn. Mm. And then there's this huge card, and I open it up, and it was like the ladies' indulgence pack. And it was like this full-day spa thing at the Four Seasons. <sighs> I told him, don't call me, I'll call you. Well, it'd be rude to not call and say thing. And I'm, I pick up the phone and I was like, well, that's one way to get a girl to call you. <laughs> He's in Detroit. I'm in California. He says, will you have dinner with me at the Four Seasons next Saturday night at 8? 
Yes. He's dress appropriately, he says to me, and hangs up the phone and I'm listening to a dial tone because they, they had those then. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, I have like $250 in my bank account at this moment. Like I think I spent 232 on the dress. And so we go, we have dinner, we have this like amazing time. Like I forgot that he's not the one because I'm like having just this blast and it was like so <laughs> fun. And I was, and then he, then he leaves and I was like, oh, whoo, almost dodged a bullet. Like, like that was close. Like, no, 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 no. Back to manifesting my soulmate. So, uh, he called like two weeks later and he was like, you want to meet me in Vegas? I got tickets for us for Andrea Bocelli. Fine. And then there at dinner, again, the veil lifted and I was like, okay, he is the one. Mm. That is an amazing story. Can I believe you don't know, just tell that like every day? <laughs> How romantic. And he still he still buys me flowers every week. Mm. And, and not that it's just about, I mean, he's my lover, my soulmate, my best mm -hmm. friend, my world traveling companion. And these days, CEO of the company. That's amazing. So have you guys had those times where you're like, you know what? I do not. You know, because we just did the romantic, and I know a lot of people are inspired, like, okay, I know how to attract my king now. Okay. So when that happens, I know it's not all butterflies and unicorns mm -hmm. all the time. So can mm -hmm. you talk about, like, probably a challenging time that you've had? Because you guys have been together for how many years now? Fifteen now. Wait, 15. Is it, wait 2004? What is this? 2020? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ish. Yeah. Give yeah. What, what would you say in those 15 plus years? <laughs> What would you say has been the most challenge you've had in your marriage? Well, I'll, I'll give one, one, one of our tips. So we're both really big personalities. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we keep things really alive is, like, we handle everything in the minute. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, when it's, it, it doesn't matter who's around. Like, like, because like we work from home and teams off and around. And, in the, you know, he'll say something, I'll be like, uh, and kill and he uh uh and he, uh, when they're new you like see their eyes get big and we it's like we don't care because we are so committed mm -hmm. to getting to the resolve right and so it's like our close friends know our team members know and they're, they're it's like it gets intense and he didn't wait it's going down and they're gonna get divorced and then all of a sudden we're laughing and someone's calling someone baby love and, the, and it's all fine mm -hmm. so um i think we've developed habits but i would say the most challenge he's the easiest part of my life the most challenging part is not getting too busy with business because because our relationship does not require work or sacrifice or any of that but it can be taken for granted i think mm. and like especially for i'll own my this for myself he's better at it than me because um, he's in school of love and i'm not but um so he prioritizes the relationship even I mean I do too but him even more so so like when I get busy with work and and I'm like really driven in that department um I think the most challenging part is not taking him for granted and not even just loving the love it's because I want the sexiness there too and mm -hmm. so it's like m not maintaining that's not the word I want to say um, prioritizing being in love also. He's an easy person to love, but it you can love your roommate too. Right. You know, so really making sure that um, we're taking time for the relationship, that I'm taking time for the relationship and creating enough space where it's like the in love part mm -hmm. also is, I would say, the biggest challenge. That's beautiful. So you gave us abundance, love. Now let's talk about how, how do you get loved up? Ooh, all the ways. Um, Top three. We'll okay. make it easy for you. Okay. Let's see. Um, they really make you feel like a queen. Is, is this with him specifically? No, just yourself. Oh, how do I love myself up? Yeah, how do you oh, love yourself? Oh, um, I prioritize pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, I have 
uh, people think I'm, uh, as much as I like to work, I'm not a workaholic at all. Like I must have something to look forward to every day. Mm -hmm. um, sadly for me, that usually comes in the form of food and wine. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I really wish I liked hiking more. <laughs> I could treat myself to a great yoga class at the end of the day. But uh, sitting by the fire, having a glass of wine and, uh, you know, so I'm a, I'm a diner. Mm -hmm. So that is, and making sure that I got something to look forward to. So that's oftentimes that. Um, more recently, it's been around sisterhood and girlfriend, like that dinner mm -hmm. that we had at Soho House and, and the community. I really let myself be isolated too long um, on my entrepreneurial journey. And I also told myself a story that the full me didn't belong anywhere. I actually do, I do write about it in the book that like, it was okay to show up like this in business or like this with my spiritual friends or like that with my family. And so it, it fragmented me and I just, I just had this story that f friends weren't important or that it would take away from what I was doing and you know, it's kind of like think that people were at, that were at brunch were just like wasting time. Um, but it was really just because I didn't believe that I could fit in fully anywhere. And so now I'm really prioritizing sisterhood mm -hmm. also. Um, and that, that's been real new for me, like within the last year, and that's been fun. And, and I just am a jet setter. Like I just, like part of the way that I love myself up is I give, I say yes to my desires and it usually involves a plane, sadly, not private transportation yet, but it does involve a plane. And I love every aspect of travel. I love, I love the packing. I love the being there. I love the meeting new people. And so, yeah, I think food and wine with my baby, sisterhood and travel are the ways. It's beautiful. I love I that. So rapid fire. Yes. Favorite book? Women Who Run With The Wolves. Mmm, nice. Favorite movie? Dangerous Beauty. Mmm, favorite song? Ooh, <clears throat> Don't Stop Me Now, Queen. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. It's been so amazing oh, to get to know you even better. Oh, yes. It's been such a joy, such a heart-opening experience. Yes. I think that, you know, everything that you have said about queendom is just great life lessons for anyone, even men. I mean, like, mm -hmm. to be a king, like, mm -hmm. even the story you got, gave about your husband is just a testament to him not giving up and going after he wanted yes. what, what he wanted and making it happen. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, my dear. I'm going to throw a little love at the audience. Until next time, love yourself, love others, and love the planet.